that God said, First Kings chapter 19, verse 11, Go stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by, and a great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are who you say you are in your word. We thank you, God, that you are here with us today, that we do not stand apart, but we stand near the creator of all there is, <laughs> who gave everything for us. And I pray today as we go into your word that you'd open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to comprehend all that you have for us today. Have your way, I pray, in your precious name. Amen. So we've been doing a series, going back to school, looking at foundational aspects of what it means to follow Christ. What does it truly mean to be a believer when we claim that we are Christians, that we follow the Lord? What are those foundational pieces that should be part of our life and, and shape who we are? And we've talked about in the past weeks about knowing and understanding God's word, how to correctly interpret it, to understand it, to dive deep into it. We've talked about the importance of prayer. And today, as I was preparing, what God parted to me was that he wanted us to talk about how important it is as believers to know his voice and to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. As I was praying, he, he was saying to me, do you know the voice of God? That was the question he wanted me to ask you today. Do you know the voice of God? And as I opened, I read a passage from 1 Kings and it's a story of Elijah who was one of the prophets of God in the Old Testament. And he was in a place of just despondency. Everything had gone bad. The rulers were killing prophets. The people of Israel had abandoned God, turned their back from him. And he had literally fled for his life. And was at a point where he just did not want to wake up in the morning. And God drew him away to this mountain and revealed himself to him. And there's such just a beautiful picture of God coming near. And of how God often speaks. That it's not in the thunder and the lightning and the wind and the rain and the fire. It's in that still, small voice. Because since the beginning of humanity, God has been communicating with us. We see this all throughout the history. We see how God came and he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve and how he spoke to Abraham and said to depart and go to a place that I will show you. How he wrestled with Jacob. How God revealed himself through prophecies and through signs, through burning bushes and plagues, that God demonstrated who he was as he imparted his word into the law. And as he spoke through the prophets, through both the words he gave them and through signs and wonders and demonstrations of his power, that throughout history God has been communicating with people. And we see this as he sent Christ, who the scriptures tells us is the word became flesh that dwelt among us. That through Christ, he demonstrated who he was and how he wanted us to live. And after Christ came, everything changed. Everything changed. Because before, before Christ, we weren't able to fully commune with God the way that we can now. Before Christ, you had to go to a temple. You had to go to a place. You had to go to a prophet. You had, to, you had the law, but you had to be able to interpret and read it, and you had to cleanse and do all these things, that there were all these hoops you had to jump through to get to God's presence. People would walk for days to get to the temple just to be as near to the presence of God as they could. And even then, there was a curtain and courtyards, and you couldn't fully go in unless you were the priest. 
And God's design and his desire from the beginning was not to keep us at arm's length, but to bring us close again as he did with Adam and Eve. And we see in the book of Ezekiel that he prophesied through the prophet Ezekiel verses 26 through 27, that he was going to transform this relationship. And we see that, you know, God did a lot of this communication through the working of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The Spirit would come on a prophet and they would speak, come on someone and they would write, come on someone and they would do something. It was this external empowering that was happening. And it was only select people. It wasn't everyone. And God's desire was to take his Spirit from out here, to take his himself from at a distance and to bring it all the way in to us and in Ezekiel 36 26 and 27 it says I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances this is so profound Because he's saying, I'm going to take this spirit, I'm going to take myself, and I'm going to put it inside you. I'm not going to give you another list of rules to follow. I'm not going to give you more cleansing that you have to do. I'm not going to change this. I'm going to take the spirit of who I am, and I'm going to put it inside you, and I'm going to transform you so that you desire to follow me, that you desire to know me, that you desire to grow in your relationship with me. That's powerful. That's powerful. That was the work that Christ was coming to do, and it was revolutionary. It was not what had been done. It is not what had been said. It is not what they had understood before. And as you study this, you know, we see all of this going on. And I, as I was preparing, I was thinking about that. Imagine, you know, we so take for granted our relationship with Christ that we can just come in here and we can worship and God's presence shows up. They did not have that gift. They did not have that gift. And we have been given such a precious gift in that through Jesus Christ, that when he died, when that curtain ripped in two in the temple, both physically and prophetically, God tore open and said, I'm here and I'm near to you because we do not serve a God that is silent. We do not serve a God that is far away. We serve a God that is near and desires to commune with us, that desires to be with us, that desires to speak with us, that we would personally know him and have a relationship with him. And we do that through the Holy Spirit, and, and, and Christ was clear that that Hearing from God, that knowing God's voice, that understanding who God was, was wrapped completely in what it meant to follow him. In John chapter 10, he says very clearly, I truly tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other ways is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep and the gatekeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he's brought them outside. He goes ahead of them. The sheep will follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. And that's what had been happening if you study the scripture in the Old Testament is that God gave them the law, gave them the prophets, but the people of God themselves did not know God's voice. They did not have that deep internal connection with God. And so someone would come along with a better idea and they would follow him. And they would worship false gods. They would sacrifice to false gods. They would sacrifice their children to false gods. They would do desperate acts because that relationship with God wasn't in here. And so Jesus is saying, though, everyone will know the voice of God. Everyone who follows him and through him will know God's voice, which means when he calls, you know it's him. When he calls, you know it's him. You know, we were uh, hanging out with some of the neighbors yesterday, and we all had our dogs out and about. And if one of the neighbor kids called one of our dogs, they don't respond because they don't know their voice. They're like, I don't know you. Who are you? But if I call my dog, it comes right to me. 
because we have a relationship. We have a relationship. I don't have sheep, so I have to use dogs as an illustration. They won't let me have sheep in town. <sighs> but they know the voice of the shepherd. We are to know the voice of God that when he speaks to us, everything stops. When he speaks to us, we know it's him calling us and not some other voices. That we would have that deep relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. That we would understand when it's God speaking to us. And you know, from previous weeks, we understand that God's voice comes to us through the scriptures. We hear God speaking to us through his word. It comes through that time we spend in prayer that God reveals things to us and speaks to us through. And all of this takes place because of the working of the Holy Spirit. Because we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians, and I know I'm jumping all over today, I'm sorry. First Corinthians chapter 2. Pastor Jared asked if I had text this morning, and I said, yes, I have a lot of it. <laughs> Beginning with verse 9, when I get there. It says, But as it is written, no eye has seen, or ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived what God has prepared for these things, for those who love him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything. So there's this understanding that the Holy Spirit reveals from God, because the Holy Spirit is God, to us, the truths of who God is and what God has for us. We only comprehend the fullness of Scripture because the Holy Spirit enables us to. You can study this book without the Holy Spirit. You'll know it a lot, but it won't transform you. It's the Holy Spirit that does that work. We have this relationship and presence of God in our life because of the Holy Spirit. That conviction you feel when you do something apart from God after coming to faith, that's the Holy Spirit working in you and revealing yourself to you and saying there's something in you that's contrary to the Spirit of God. There's something you're doing that's contrary to the Spirit of God. There's something in you that's withholding God's Spirit's ability to function and flow within you and for you to commune with God the way God desires you to. That's what that is. It reveals us. It reveals God. It reveals the truth of God's word. It makes everything clear. So then how do we know for sure it's God's voice speaking to us? How do we know? God's voice always stays on mission. Always stays on mission. And what's the mission? Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, right? That the whole world would know. And the other aspect of the mission is that we would become more like who? Like Jesus. So if we hear anything that's telling us the opposite of that, <laughs> telling us what we want to hear, we know it's probably ourselves, <laughs> That if what we're hearing and thinking isn't in line with God's word, it is in line with the truth that God has for us, it's not God's voice, it's our own. Or someone else. But God speaks to us and desires to speak to us. And I love Ephesians. We're going to go there next. Because we receive this when we receive Christ. When we confess and accept Christ as our Savior, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit becomes part of our life. And in Ephesians 1.13 it says, In him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed. And as a side note, I like to imagine that like a tattoo inside somehow, because that's just how I think, like a big tattoo on my soul. <laughs> that is sealed with the Holy Spirit. That you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
And it goes on further to say the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Okay. This verse gets me shook because it's so incredible. So not only are we sealed with the Spirit, that we can have this relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, that we can commune with God, that we hear his voice, we can understand his scripture, we can know when we're making choices outside of God's will, that we can be encouraged to share our faith, all of this kind of stuff. But it tells us that it's a down payment on our inheritance, that through the Holy Spirit, we receive God's presence, we receive a taste of what is to come. Because God didn't just redeem us, that we would go to heaven, but he said, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to reveal myself to you, and my Holy Spirit's going to enable me to do that, that we can experience in part what we will know in full. That that presence of God, that we will be breathing when we are with him forever. That we cannot even comprehend that in the past when people encountered the glory of God, they fell as though dead in the scripture. That undescribable presence of God. That we can have that in part through the Holy Spirit in our lives. That God will speak to us directly. That God will reveal himself to us directly. That he will fill our lives with his presence is incredible. I mean, think about that. The God who made you wants to hang out with you and reveal himself to you and wants you to feel his presence in your life, to know him. And I was talking to Pastor Jared about this. Is, you know, I was raised in a Pentecostal church. I've known about the Holy Spirit my whole life, and as a believer, I've lived with the Holy Spirit active in my life in a way that I don't know what it's like to live without it, and I know that I couldn't. You know, we are gifted and encouraged to daily go to spend time with God, and it's because daily we can receive from him in part what he's going to show us and reveal to us in full. It's like, hey, I invited you to spend forever with me, but every day if you come to me, I'm going to give you a piece of this. I'm going to give you a piece of myself. I'm going to reveal part of myself to you. I'm going to transform you to be more like me. You're not going to have to wait forever to know me. You're not going to have to wait forever to experience my love and my life in your life. You can come every day and I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you more if you ask more. I'm going to show you what it is to know me and be known by me if you do that. And I'm going to guide you. And the thing about the Holy Spirit is you let the Holy Spirit have his way in your life. When you let God reveal himself in this way in your life, it changes how you do things. There's been times we've been driving down the road and I'll say, don't go that way. Because we just know that God's saying, go right and not left. We don't know why. Or in my job where I call people every day and I, I support people in bereavement, there are times where I haven't talked to someone in a while because they were doing good, and, and I feel the Holy Spirit say, you need to call them today. And I call them, and they say, I can't, I'm so glad you called me today because I'm not okay today. And it was divinely appointed, but I wouldn't have known to do that if I wasn't listening. <laughs> I wouldn't have known to do that if I didn't have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't know how to live and to function without it. You know, and there have been times we've chose to do things the opposite, right? And it did not go well. <laughs> it did not go well. It caused a lot of headache and heartache. And, you know, having that relationship with God changes how we live. It changes how we think. It changes how we function. And it changes how we view God. Because God is not far away. God is not a list of rules. God is not someone who wants us to, to live our life difficult. God is someone who loves us so much, who desires to pour himself into us so much, who desires that we are surrounded by him and his presence. So that when people come close to us, they say there's something different about you. And what's different about you is the Holy Spirit is flowing through your life. 
The reason that we see in the New Testament some of the workings that happened where the shadow of the apostles healed people is because the Holy Spirit was flowing through their life. You know, God did a transformative work as they came to know him. And it's interesting because the scripture tells us that you will be my witnesses, right? But we cannot witness what we do not know. We cannot bear witness what we have not seen. And if we aren't pouring ourselves into God and letting God pour into us, we have no idea what we're talking about. Because we haven't experienced it for ourselves. So through Christ, we have this relationship. And through the Holy Spirit, we have this gift to experience in part what we will experience in full when we are with the Lord. Because God wants us to know him and have a relationship with him. And another aspect of this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to jump back to Acts and just highlight this briefly. And I am doing a very Cliff's Notes version of this. I could do weeks just talking about the Holy Spirit. Because if you start seeing the Holy Spirit in the scripture, it goes, I mean, he's all the way through Genesis to the end. And there's so much to unpack. Because it's God. You know, we talk about the triune God. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not an afterthought. The Holy Spirit is not the B team. The Holy Spirit is fully God. And it's how God reveals himself to us. And in Acts chapter 2, oh, we're going to go back to chapter 1, just kidding. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, this is Jesus saying, While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise, which he said, You have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? He said, it is not for you to know times or periods but the Father has sent by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism, which is separate from what we receive when we come to faith in Christ. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit in your life, okay? Everything I'm talking about, you have the Holy Spirit in your life. God will reveal himself through the Holy Spirit to you. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a secondary thing. And the idea behind it was that it would empower the believers to be his witnesses. And as we study this, it goes on and talks about how the early church, when they prayed, the early church. They weren't a church yet. I am sorry. <laughs> Prior to them being a church, <laughs> they gather, they pray, and we see this transformation that happens in chapter two where tongues of fire come above their heads and they start speaking in other tongues. And so we understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit is often demonstrated by speaking in other tongues. You receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you speak in other tongues. And often it's a heavenly language, not an earthly language, though people do at times speak in an earthly language they have not known. We could get into a whole xenolalia versus glossolalia. That's a whole other conversation. But that God does this work, and he does it not just to make us weird, but to empower us to be his witnesses, because something happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that changes how you view the world. It changes how you feel about what God is capable of doing in the life of someone else. And it's available to everyone, the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 17. This is in the last days. God, I said, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I'll even pour out my spirit on your servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. That the Holy Spirit, this gift, is available to every single person of all ages, races, genders. It's everyone. Okay? There's no exception to this. But it's something that is different than when we receive salvation, and I want to make that clear. Some of people, people confuse the two. They are not the same thing. Okay? It's something that we can pray about and ask God to do in our lives, and it, and it does make a difference in the life of a believer. And I will be honest that not everybody's going to experience it, and that's okay. Can I say that? Not everybody's going to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not everybody's going to speak in tongues, but that doesn't mean you have, don't have a good relationship with God. It doesn't mean you don't know him. It doesn't mean that you don't love him. It doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life. It just means you're having a different experience of faith. 
than other people. And like for myself, when I received the baptism, it just changed everything. Um, and so it's something I encourage you to pray about, to pray about. Ask God if this is, is something he wants to do in your life and to ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit in this way. Because it, is tra- it was for the purpose of doing his work to empower the church, and we see that it just blew the roof off of everything. We're here because of this. We stand here today receiving the gospel because they received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and they started preaching, and it just blew up across the world. And in many ways, some of the issues we see with the modern church is because we've departed from these things. We've departed from letting the Holy Spirit do what it wants. We've embraced programs and other things in place of God's work when God had the best plan from the beginning that he would transform us from within and empower us from without that we could be his people and we could serve him and do what he's called us to do. So I am going to be super brief today. But I'd like to close and give some time here and I just have a few questions for you. The first one is, how are your spiritual ears? How well do you hear God? Does God talk to you? You can be honest, I'm not going to commit you. Does God talk to you? Does God speak to you? Do you know if it's God speak to you? Does he speak to you through his word? Does he speak through that still, small voice? Does God speak to you? And are you listening? And are you daily seeking to commune with God? And I'm not talking about just reading some verses and praying to get your day going. It's like a protein bar for breakfast, all right? (laughs) Are you communing with God? Are you cultivating time to let God be in your life? For me, I just, I I have the weirdest prayer life because for me, it's just, I just start my day talking to God and it just goes throughout the day. And there are moments in time where I'm just alone and I'm just in it. And other times I'm like, Jesus, I need more of you in my life right now because otherwise they're not going to see anything good. <laughs> you know, there's, we have those that it's, it's all day. I just keep talking to God and listening to God. And it's this constant conversation that begins as soon as I get up in the morning and ends when I go to sleep unless God's speaking to me through dreams or waking me up in the night to pray for somebody. It's, it's, it's there. That we commune with him. That he's not on a shelf somewhere, but he's with us and in our lives, revealing himself through the Holy Spirit. And then the last one is, have you ever prayed to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Some of you, this may be a new concept that it's even possible for you, and that's okay. But something to consider, something to ask God about, to pray about and say, hey, you know, I see this is here. I hear it's still for today. Is this something you want to be part of my life? And asking God to reveal that to you. You know, I was raised in a church where we would invite people up to the altar and we would pray for everybody, but I know people receive the baptism anywhere. (laughs) So I'm not going to necessarily do that today. But that if you want someone to pray with you, we'll pray with you. But on your own, I encourage you to pour into the scriptures, to study this for yourself, to really come to understand what that is and to ask God if it's something he wants to do in your life. Because it is personal. It's personal for you and for what God wants for you.